Hey, in this video, you're going to get 10 of the most practical tools for productivity and time management. Now, I emphasize the word practical because it's so cliche to do a video about productivity and time management, but if you actually implement some of these things, and again, I focus on the ones that are very practical and implementable and not just like, hey, you need to have a great vision. Uh, if you implement these, right, I often in my models of happiness, I say time management is kind of the foundation for happiness and quality of life. And the reason for that is it helps you go from knowing to doing. I think pretty much all of us tend to know what we need to do or ought to do in order to be happier. We're like, yeah, you know, if I just had a little more income or if I just got a little bit more sleep or I started exercising or I spent more time with my friends and family, then I'd be a little bit happier. But then what happens? Well, every year January comes around and we say, I'm going to read more books, I'm going to work out more, and I'm going to eat healthier. And then it's like January 15th and we have this stack of unread books on our nightstand and we're kind of pissed because this gym membership we bought for $30 a month and I've only used it once and you probably get what I'm talking about. So here's the thing, time and action are inseparable. Time and action are inseparable. So if you have some cognitive tools that you can use to better manage your time and your behavior... You're going to be able to take actions and kind of change or manipulate, and I say manipulate in a good way, manipulate your own sort of quality of life and lifestyle. So again, in this video, you're going to get some of these tools. Another bonus of this video is you can almost think of it as a kind of a review or an unboxing that's going to hopefully help you cut through the noise of productivity and time management because when I Googled it, I Googled earlier time management and productivity, there were 753 million Google search results. There's thousands of books published every year. And so it's kind of like just overwhelming. I'm going to go through an order of, there's 10 of them. And they're basically based on what I found the most practical. Now I'm not going to claim to be some expert guru or something, but I do run my own speaking and consulting practice now. Uh, working about 30 hours a week and still have time for all these other things like exercise, friends, family, whatever. So I think I do a pretty good job of time management. And if you know by now, if you've been following my channel, channel, excuse me, I'm incredibly neurotic and very nerdy. So you can trust that I was looking at my bookshelf right now of all these different books kind of relating to these things. And more importantly, they're not just things that I've come up with. A lot of these ideas are coming from folks like David Allen, He's been a management consultant to top CEOs and military leaders across the entire world. You've got things in there from Scott Shute, former executive at LinkedIn, also a good mindfulness teacher. Uh, I've got James Clear, right? Atomic Habits. Andrew Huberman, who's now very big in this sort of space, uh, Stanford neuroscientist. It's lots of other really successful, probably more intelligent than me folks on this list that I think you'll enjoy. So let's get into it. Number one, number one tool lists and calendar lists and calendar and i'll kind of put those two into one thing and i'll show you in a second how this works but the main idea here main idea comes from a guy named david allen who said the mind is for having ideas not for holding them the mind is for having ideas not for holding them you can also think about albert einstein who has a quote that says the mind is for thinking paper is used to write things down that you need to remember so the main idea when you start with lists this is right like kind of step one if you're trying to improve your time management, your productivity, your kind of self-management even, is making lists. Get things out of your head and onto paper. Because a lot of the stress in our lives and a lot of the things that we F up or put off or don't get around to, I believe, is because it's just that. If you think about how the mind evolved, right, it's a mind, it's evolved to focus and have thoughts. It's not a computer that's meant to store this database of commitments and things and logistics you need to remember. And so when you have those, they create cognitive stress, right? Every time we have kind of an open loop or an open commitment, that's like one more thing that's sort of like adding a adding a weight into a basket or something. You add another weight, add another weight, add another weight, and those things start to pick up, and we call that cognitive stress. So by offloading some of that into just an external system that can contain all those commitments and loops, that's offloading a lot of stress already and helping us to be more effective. So when you're thinking about a list, it's as simple as having, you can have one big list if you just want to have a to-do list. I like to break mine into three. Number one is projects, which are like kind of bigger picture ongoing things. Then you have actions, which are very specific one-time things. And then you have a wait list. And this is particularly important if you work in a company or an organization or on a team. Your wait list is things that you don't have to do, but you're waiting on from other people. So you don't want to have to, again, be like, wait, wasn't Jeff supposed to send me that thing the other day? So that's lists, but you can't really get into the list without also talking about the calendar. 
because a list is just this thing of all these things that I should do or have to do or want to do. And then the calendar is where you actually start to make them into a reality. And so on the calendar, you have things like uh, meetings where you actually have to meet with another person or be at a certain place at a certain time. And you have what I call time targets, which is when you block out when you're actually going to work on some of those things that are on your list. So why don't you take a look at my system here? I'll give you a, just a quick example. So on the calendar side, this is, has a lot going on here, but just stay with me. You don't have to do it exactly this way. The calendar side has these time targets and appointments. So in red are things with other people, things that have to be done at that exact time. Yellow are targets, which are things that I would like to do each day. So a lot of these are recurring. You know, every day, first thing in the morning, I try to spend 90 minutes or so on business stuff. And then in the evening, I like to spend that time reading and working on my kind of happiness PhD. Then I have some coaching clients here, a team meeting with my business partner. And then the things in blue are like personal health, so fitness stuff. Now, here's how this one works. You have your list of projects here. So these are all my ongoing projects kind of in order of priority. Then I have all the actions associated with them. And then of course, things I'm waiting on. So what happens is something comes into my system. They, oh, do you know what? I need to work on uh, finishing up our kind of like email drip course thing that we've been working on. So I'm gonna put that in my projects list. And then are there any actions associated with that? Well, I'm just gonna move it over to my actions list to say, oh, I got to uh, send an email and work with our contractor, Ron. Okay. so. That's now captured in my list. I don't have to remember it. When I start my day, I can just go into my projects and actions and say, what do I have to work on right now? And then if I want to, I can also move some of those into my calendar so I can schedule out, okay, Wednesday morning at 10 a.m., I'm gonna work on funnel stuff with Ron, whatever. And then I'll put it in yellow. So I can't give you a fully exhaustive system right now but come back to me, if you think about just really two pieces there, anything I have to do or want to do or should do, I'm capturing in a list somewhere. If it's a really big thing, maybe it's a project. If it's a one-time thing, maybe it's just an action. If I'm waiting on more from someone, maybe it's just wait list. But then I'm trying to, for things that I have to do at a certain time, put it in my calendar. And then things that I want to make sure I work on, because how many times does this happen? You say, I've got this really important project, this really important thing, I want, I want to start reading more. And then a week goes by or a day goes by and you're like, what the hell just happened? I didn't actually make any progress on it. So that's where the time blocking comes in or time targeting, as I say, is maybe you put down in red, I have to do it at this time. You put in yellow, I'm going to target doing an hour of it at this time. And it's all set up so that when you actually go into your day, literally all I do in my day, I make no decisions. Listen to me. I make no decisions and I love it. I hate making decisions because I just go in there and I say, what is on my calendar right now? I need to be working on this. And then if there's an open window, I can pop back over to my projects or actions list and say, okay, what's the most important thing to try to work on right now? Oh, there's one action I can do. I can, you know, run out to the store and get eggs. I don't know. Come back easy. So that right there, getting all of this bullshit out of your head and into an external system between your list and calendar is probably the single biggest thing you can do that's gonna improve your quality of life and help you manage a lot more stuff with way lower stress. The second productivity time management tool is what I call behavior-based goals or systems instead of goals. So let me break those two things down. So behavior-based goals, this comes from a lot of different people, but one person who has a really good summary of it is Dr. Andrew Huberman from Stanford. And he talks about this, right? It's basically saying, how can you take some goal that's a result or an output and focus on the inputs acquired to get it. And think of your goal, not as some destination, but as a verb or a behavior. So listen to this, let's say, I wanna lose 10 pounds. Well, that's a great goal, I wanna lose 10 pounds. And you can say, oh, I want it to be a SMART goal, which by the way, I think SMART goals are way overrated. But I want it to be specific, measurable, actionable, results-based, timed, whatever the acronym is. And it's like, all right, I'm gonna lose 10 pounds in three months, I know it. Okay, well, if you just write that down and nothing else happens, you're gonna weigh the same or maybe a few pounds more three months from now. So a verb or behavior-based goal is thinking about, you know, what are the steps that would be required physically in the tangible world to achieve that goal? So you can say, all right, well, I think if I just did uh, 100 minutes of, 150 minutes of cardio each week, that would get me in the right direction. So I'm gonna say uh, Monday through 
Friday, I'm going to do 30 minutes of cardio each day. Now I would go beyond that and going back to the calendar, actually put in a time target for 30 minutes of cardio to say, when are you going to do it and where so that you have it very clear and you don't have to decide every single day. Am I going to do it after lunch? Am I going to do it after work? Am I going to do it in the morning? You just know, but you can see how going from that outputs to inputs, when you're focusing on the behavior or the action or the verb that is required to achieve that outcome, you're gonna be way more effective. And that relates closely to the second part of this, really they're one and the same, but I said the idea of going from goals to systems. So same exact idea. If your goal is to write a book, what is your system or your set of behavioral goals that are going to lead to that? Well, most likely you're gonna to have to write something. <laughs> the amount of writers out there is like, oh, I wanna be a writer and I really have this book I'm working on. And it's like, well, you know, how, how, much are you, how much have you written? How often are you writing? And they're like, well, I'm still kind of figuring it out. Bullshit. There has to be a verb or a behavior or a system attached to get that output over there. It's like I said, if I wanna to get to Philadelphia, which is like six hours away, at some point I'm gonna to have to get in the car and drive there. That is the behavior. So when you're thinking about, again, the system is just your set of behavioral goals. So it might be for reading a book, you have to say, okay, first, I think I need to do one time, I'm gonna do four hours of basically learning about how to write really effective books. And there's a, a book out there, I think, called How to Write Valuable Books or something that's been recommended to me. You say, I'm gonna actually learn how to structure it and make an outline for it. And then you gotta create this behavioral system. So it might be, okay, uh, well, looking at my work schedule, it's pretty busy, so really I can only do Monday and Wednesday evenings for two hours, I'm gonna sit down and have like my writing block. So every Monday and Wednesday, I've gotta hit those two hour blocks. Right there, again, if you do that, by the end of the year, that's four hours a week, that's 200 hours of writing. So you're actually getting the inputs required to get to your output. So anytime you're thinking about a, a goal or something you wanna accomplish, or an end state you wanna to get to, one of the most powerful tools is try to make that goal into a behavioral verb-based goal with a system that takes care of it, right? And so even if it's something more complicated, like, oh, I wanna make $200,000 of sales, I don't know. There might be multiple pieces of that, but that means, okay, we have to do every morning, uh, we have to have a system set up to send out 10 cold emails, and then we have to have an automated scheduling system. And then once we're on the call, I have to follow my script of exactly what I'm gonna say. And then afterwards, we have to send them the sign-up information, whatever. Right? There's an entire system that's leading to that goal. Number three, this is kind of a short one, is the weekly, or in my case, bi-weekly review. Because no matter how elegant or great or whatever your time management productivity system is, we're human beings. So it's not, it's gonna get messy. It's like Mike Tyson, I think, said that everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Well, with this, it's like everyone has this great little productivity system, myself included, until it encounters reality and then it gets really damn messy. So bi-weekly or weekly review is sort of like, hey, clean up your room, right? You gotta clean up the kitchen, you gotta clean up the bathroom every couple of weeks, every week. And so this is sort of like a life organizational cleanup every week or every two weeks in my case. And so all this is, is whatever your system is, you're kind of just sitting down and cleaning it up, seeing what fell out, tying up loose ends, et cetera. So for my thing with the lists and calendar I showed you, it could be going through your list and saying what needs to be prioritized? Is there anything that needs to be checked off? Is there anything that needs to be added? Is this project here that's really big and ambiguous? Can I turn it into a few action steps and put those in my actions list. Oh, I'm, wait, I'm still waiting on some stuff from these people, can I follow up there? And then I'm gonna look at my calendar and say, all right, can I schedule any of this stuff out? Or is there anything I missed from last week that I need to move to this week? Or you get the idea. But this is sort of a, a key piece of any system or something you're implementing is every week or every two weeks sitting down and getting clear on, okay, so what are the things I need to do? What do I have to do? What do I want to do? And maybe if you have some sorts of goals or resolutions even, this is like a check and adjust to say, oh, well, I said I was gonna start reading more, but I haven't actually read anything in the last two weeks. What needs to change? Number four, I call this the rice and chopsticks rule. The rice and chopsticks rule. So this is a little bit different than the first few tools because it's not as much of a very like tangible like tactic, but it's more of a, a principle and a tool you can use to navigate and think about life. So there's a Zen story where this young student, young man, goes to see the old wise Zen master, right? This wise enlightened teacher. And he lives in this beautiful palace surrounded by this amazing tea garden and these huge blue mountains. 
And you know, he goes to the master who's kind of sitting cross-legged up on his thing, and he says, hey, I want to know the secret to happiness. I want to know the secret to a good life. And the master says, sure, but I can't talk to you right now, so just do me a favor. Here, take these chopsticks and hold this little grain of rice in there. Go around, check out my palace, you know, check out the gardens, look at the mountains, you know, visit around people, listen to some of the, the music, and then come back here and we'll chat. Okay, but one condition, do not drop the rice I gave you. Don't drop it. So the kid goes around and he kind of walks around and he's out there, but he's holding that rice. He's like really carefully because you can imagine that would be a pain in the ass. And he goes around, he comes back finally after hours and the guy's like, all right, let's talk. But I want to ask you something. Did you notice the beautiful blue mountains? Did you notice the sky? Did you notice my amazing gardens or the beautiful bells playing? And the kid is sort of embarrassed. He's like, well, not really. I just had to focus on these chopsticks. And so the Zen master says, all right, that's fine. Go out. Let's try this again, but really enjoy the scenery. And so the kid's eyes like, oh my God, those mountains are amazing. Or look at these beautiful plants and Oh, the sound of these little bells is so peaceful. It's amazing, this place. And he comes back, and the master says, did you enjoy it? And he's like, yes, it was incredible. And he says, all right, can I have my grain of rice? And he looks down, and he's holding the chopsticks, but there's no grain of rice. And so the master says, well, if there is one secret to happiness, it is this. To enjoy all of the sights and sensations and pleasures of this life fully but to never lose track of that one grain of rice. And so this is the idea of intention, but also attention to saying it's absolutely all right to have a vision to sort of pursue. I want my happiness tomorrow. I want to have a better life, but essentially, and I've made this mistake many times. So I'm speaking from experience is pursuing happiness tomorrow without giving up happiness today. Because if you're anything like me, very often you'll say, oh, I just got to get through this week. Or I got to get through this month. It's going to be kind of a sprint the next few weeks. But then I can really like chill and step back and relax and like have time to do stuff. But that's really a form of happiness procrastination. <laughs> We're putting off our happiness to say, oh, once I get this certain thing, it's like then I can be happy. But we can only be happy right now. So that's the point of this story is it's fine to have a vision, to have focus, to have these goals that we're pursuing, but not at the expense of our happiness today. Number five, kind of goes along with this one, but it's a little more tangible, is having a vision to optimize for. Have a vision to optimize for. So it's again, it sounds a little cliche to have a vision, but I'm gonna get very specific about this. You need vision and measurements. So I'll show you just a snapshot of my one page vision and sort of process thing. But right here, I have a very clear vision for the future I want, looking at these three key areas. So my physical health and body, my mind and heart or kind of emotional life, and then my career and finance. And now the exact wording is gonna depend on what you want, but I'm very clear in each one, number one, on the vision I wanna have. Say I'm an athlete, I'm energized, I feel well rested, I have about 10% body fat with no pain, and I have good strength and cardio. But then importantly, I have measures so I say it, my kind of baseline or my goals are a weight of like 177, no lower back pain or pain in general, and then a couple measures for my physical strength and cardio. But then same thing in my kind of like emotional happiness life, I have a little bit of a few words about that. Like here's the state I want to get to. I can kind of see myself in and I want to embody happiness. I want to feel growth and love and playfulness and also, I have measures. So this check-in with Brady, he's my roommate, but I sort of check in with him sometimes. And I'm like, hey, have I been being an asshole lately? <laughs> or I say like, hey, have I been seeming really tense or wound up lately? Or am I pretty good? And then I just have a self-assessment where I like rate my own happiness from one to 10. And then finally, career and finance. So I'm very clear here on what my goals are. I want to be a happiness teacher. I want to be the first happiness PhD. I'm time rich, which is important. This gets at your values. And I say here, I'm making $27,000 per quarter and I'm working about 30 hours a week maximum. Bring it back to me. The reason I emphasize this is because if you don't have a clear idea of the future vision you want, you're not really able to make decisions effectively right now. So what do I mean by that? Well, Last two years ago, my first job out of college, I was made, I made about $160,000, worked like, had to be online like 45-ish hours a week. 
And so I was like, okay, this is pretty good. But I thought, well, if my future vision is working more like 30 hours a week and the vast majority of that time is working on my like happiness PhD stuff or doing talks or teaching courses or coaching people one-on-one, -on -one, first of all, that's more money than I even care to make because I just said basically what I'm optimizing for is about $27,000 per quarter, which ends up being you know, about $100,000. $12,000 or $110,000 per year. Like that's more than enough for me to be comfortable. So I would rather take a risk and go full-time running my own business so that I can work a little less, but do the type of work I want to do. And I'll probably make a little less money for a few years because that's the nature of starting your own thing. But I think I'm going to be happier with this way. And so now if someone came to me and said, Hey Jackson, we want you to work at this investment bank. We'll pay you $200,000 a year. It'd be very easy for me to say, uh, no, I don't want to do that. But a lot of people, if you're not really clear on your kind of values and that vision of, well, what do you really want in your life? Do you want to just make as much money as possible? Because that seems to be what a lot of people are optimizing for. And pardon my French, but that's fucking stupid. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't, right? Beyond certain amounts of money, you see there's a lot of diminishing returns between wealth and happiness. And quite frankly, I've seen what happens with some of my friends who are young millionaires and they're still great people, but they're just spending money on stupid shit all the time. So I would way rather say, I want to work 20 hours a week and make $100,000 a year and just do whatever I want. That exact kind of trade-off point is obviously up to you. But this vision could also have things about, you know, what's the type of work you want to be doing? Who do you want to be working with? Where do you want to be living? What do you want from your physical body? What do you want in your emotional life? You could say, oh, I want to be married to the guy or girl of my dreams. Whatever it is, the idea here is that if you don't know your destination pretty darn clearly, how on earth are you going to get there, right? If I'm going to say, oh, I don't really know if I want to go to Dallas, Texas or Seattle, Washington, I can kind of get on the highway and start heading west. <laughs> but within a couple hours, I'm going to need to decide, hey, do I need to go south or do I need to go north? So the idea here is to come up with a clearly articulated vision for what we want our end state to be and kind of what we're valuing with that and start to come up with some measures. Because a lot of things I work on in coaching is sort of like this. Oftentimes people say, oh, I think I know what I want, but then it's like, do you really know what you want? How would you know that you were successful once you got there? Because again, someone could be like, oh, you know, I think I want to just improve my business. Okay, well, if you made a thousand more dollars next year, would, would that be it? And they're like, oh, I don't know. Well, what if you made a hundred thousand more dollars? Would you be satisfied or would you still want more? We don't know. So we need to have some measures in place to check and adjust to see how we're doing. And this helps to again, make it kind of tangible. Now, some of things are inherently more subjective, subjective, like your emotional life or your happiness, but certain things are not like your body weight or your uh, max strength bench press, let's say, or again, things like well, how are other people viewing my happiness? Or, you know, how many hours per week am I spending on X versus Y? All of these things, right, are about getting an end state to optimize for right now. And if you don't have that, it's going to be really hard to make decisions, structure your time, and choose how to do things in a way that's efficient and effective. Six, <laughs> sorry. We're getting back into more specific tactical tools here. This one is called maker versus manager. Maker versus manager. And this idea that there are two sort of structures to how we manage our time. The maker or the creative person needs kind of big chunks of time, like two, three, four hours to really get in deep and do something like work on writing a book, work on coding some big project, uh, working off you're an architect, making blueprints for a house. And then the manager, right, is just sort of this person who's got, I got a 30 minute meeting here, then I got to check in with them and then I got to look at some email. And it's kind of these short intervals of more shallow, less deep, intensive work. So it is important to structure your days in this way is pick when is your peak two, maybe three hours to the extent possible where you're really in the zone. Most people, that's going to be about nine or 10 AM to about noon or one o'clock. Some people are more evening people. That's fine. But ideally in that window, you're creating a maker type schedule to the extent possible for any of your big picture projects, your strategy, your creative work. Even if you're not an entrepreneur like me and you're working in a company, same thing, right? I imagine you have some bigger picture, important projects that you have to work on even if it's just managing all your different stuff, right? Kind of carving out time where you're focused, you're in the zone and you can have some space to be that maker, right? Larger uninterrupted times where we can drop into the state of deeper focus. Because as you probably know, right? It's not like you can just switch it on or switch it off. It kind of takes time to get into the flow of some big project and then you're in it, right? For a few hours and you really get deep and then you kind of have to step back. Whereas if every 15 minutes you're breaking that, 
And that's actually called task switching, and it's shown to dramatically decrease your performance and decrease your motivation and willpower. But most of us, especially if you don't own your own business, have to have some manager time too for meetings, for other people, for these little things, you know, upkeep on email, whatever. So the idea here is to try to break your day up into those and carve out time when you're at your best to be that maker, to do that really deep, essential core work. Oftentimes the projects that are kind of the most complicated and hardest and the ones we tend to push off, those are good things to assert in that time. And if you don't have full control over your time, you're still working on a job, like you could totally just do this a few days a week. It doesn't have to be every single day. But you wanna think about setting up time of how can I distinguish between manager and maker and make sure I have some maker type time blocked out or carved out when I'm at my best to do important shit. Number seven, this is the full body yes, also known as the, if it's not a hell yes, it's a no. But you can just remember it as the body yes. Now this full body yes idea comes from a friend of mine, Scott Shute, who's a former executive at LinkedIn and now does a lot about mindfulness and conscious leadership. I mean, it's really saying this, if your body is not kind of like a big excited yes, then you should say no to it. Now, Derek Sivers, who's pretty popular now, has a similar rule. He says, if it's not a hell yes, it's a no. And the idea here is, especially as we get older, we tend to accumulate more and more and more and more commitments. And a lot of them are things that are just not even that great, that are taking away time from the things that we really want to be working on or doing. So this rule is a simple heuristic or sort of an eraser to help us cut out uh, excess commitments and make decisions more effectively. So it's essentially saying, if you're thinking about maybe doing a new project or a new task, you can say, oh, do I really wanna do this? Or how inspired am I? Eh, I don't know, maybe. Versus, oh, I can just feel like this is a yes. I have to do it. So it's a change in emotion, which is embodied physically. So same thing as the hell yes versus no rule, where you say, oh, hell yeah, I wanna go out to that party. Versus if you're like, oh, well, some of my friends want me to go out and party, but I don't even know if I really wanna drink. I wanna get up early and then don't fucking go. Just get up early and do whatever you wanted to do. So this rule is saying if it's not a full on yes that you really feel excited about, then to the extent possible, say no. Now granted, you may have a job or you have other commitments that this rule can't be done all the time. But if you try to do this a little bit more, I promise you it's gonna help free up a little bit more spaciousness and a little more time for you to do the things that you actually wanna be doing. Or if you're at a point of indecision maybe where you're like, what do I, I don't know what I should even be focusing on right now try to look into the body or try to look for those things that really excite you on an emotional level. And that's going to help to tap into those subconscious emotional motivations and resources to help you be more effective. Eight, the money value of time, the money value of time. So this is a bit of a play on words because you've probably heard if you took an intro to finance class, the time value of money, that money itself has time or that the money itself over time has value. That's what interest rates are. Right, that if I give you money right now, then a year from now, I should get back that same amount plus a little bit of interest. The money value of time is saying that your time has a market rate. Your time has a market rate. If you're working for a company, that's whatever your salary is divided by the amount of hours you work, that's your hourly rate. If you're just paid per hour, that's what it is. If you own your own business, it's harder to determine. But what that means is that's saying that each hour of your time, let's say, is worth about that much. And then you can set a goal for what you wanna maybe progress to that's kind of reasonable. So right now, mine is about $112 per hour. That's what I value my time at. What can I get purely kind of in the economic market? Well, on my last job, I was paid, it worked out to about $65 an hour, maybe 70. Okay, so I now have some, some ideas around this. So where this comes into play is then when you're making decisions or managing your time, it's to say anything that, needs done that I don't want to do or I'm not the best person to do, can I pay someone else a value that is less than my hourly time, money value of time to do it for me? So here's a great example. I hate cleaning. And so when I think about my expertise, right, my expertise is as a speaker, as a coach, as a teacher, as a creator, as a nerd studying stuff, and also as a business strategist. Okay. So that's my expertise. And I want to get like, I, can't, I know I can get consistently $70 an hour, but I really want to get about $112 per hour. Now I need to clean my bathroom. Hmm. Well, would it be wise to pay someone $112 per hour to clean a bathroom? I don't think so. I think there's plenty of people out there that'll do it for 15 bucks an hour. So I'm going to go online and hire a maid to spend four hours, and by no means, I'm not like rich here, but I'm going to do maybe once every two weeks, once a month, spend four hours cleaning, pay them like 
80 bucks, boom, there you go. And I think economically speaking, that's an intelligent thing to do because again, the market is telling me the time value of my money is between 70 to $112 per hour. So what I would challenge you to think about is if it's, it could be chores or things you don't like doing, having someone to do that, but it also could be things for a business or projects, things like that is saying, what is get a reasonable estimate and get a sort of a aspirational goal measurement of what is the hourly value of your time in dollars and then make decisions based off that number. So same thing for me, like changing the oil in my car. I might say, yeah, I could YouTube it and figure out how to do it and spend probably an hour doing it. Or I could just go pay like 60 bucks. Again, I think it's the most efficient way to do things. And it's going to help you to be happier because it helps you do less of the things that you don't want to do. Number nine is the two minute rule. This one's really simple. This comes from David Allen. He's a management consultant. Same guy I mentioned earlier about getting things out of your head. He says, anytime a task comes in that will take less than two minutes to do, just do it right then. This is a really useful one for tidying up, for maybe sending a quick email. Now, I don't think you wanna do this necessarily if you're in the middle of like a deep work block, if you're you know spending two hours writing a book and I don't know, on or reading a book even, and halfway through you're like, oh wait, I should maybe go clean my microwave. Probably not the time to do it. But generally speaking, if you've come across a task that can be done in two minutes, just do it right then. Because otherwise it usually gets put off and they start to accumulate and then you're just drowning in these little things. Two minutes or less, oh, the trash is a little full, boom, I'll just run out and do it. Easy. So number 10 is the one thing or the highlight rule. And here's how this one works. It's basically saying, you know, you have all these lists and calendars and tasks and all these different things, but it's gonna ask you each and every day, what is the one thing that if you could get it done or make progress on it or get that result, that it would kind of make everything else irrelevant and it would take you in the direction that you wanna go for your vision, for your goals, et cetera. And you can also think the highlight rule is the same thing as basically taking your to-do list and highlighting one thing that's like the key thing for that day. You say, if I get that done, that's a win. You could maybe go up to three with the highlight rule, three non-negotiables, but I think it's best to stick to one. So if you want more on that, you can check out the book, The One Thing. But the idea here is essentially trying to simplify. So a lot of the stuff I just gave you is great, but it can have a little bit of complexity if you have these different lists and your calendar, I have all these different goals and I have my vision and it's like, great. You have the vision, the state you want, kind of the type of life you want. You have all these different things you could do. So let's just keep it simple to start today or tomorrow. What's the one thing? Maybe it's not even on your list yet, but what's the one thing you could do that make today a win? It would help you make progress on, remember the rice rule, the rice and chopsticks rule, happiness tomorrow, but would still bring you some happiness today. So this is gonna help you to narrow your focus a lot and help you to prioritize more effectively. So there you have it. I'll rattle them back off here, the 10 rules. So the first is the list and calendar. Then you have behavioral goals and systems. Then you have the weekly or bi-weekly review. Then you have the vision with measurements to optimize for. Then you have the rice and chopsticks rule. And then you have the maker versus manager. Then you have the full body yes. Then you have the money value of time. Then you have the two minute rule. And then you have the one thing or the highlight rule. If you even just pick a couple of those and start to implement them, and again, they were in order of priority, I think what's gonna happen is that you're gonna have a totally different relationship to time and productivity, but not even just productivity ultimately happiness. Cause the same reason I call it happier time management is not just so that you can cross more bullshit off your to-do list. It's so that you can say, Oh no, I'm actually intentionally deciding the things I want to do and prioritize in my life. And not only am I deciding, but then I'm actually managing myself to take action on them in a consistent, sustainable way. And that's going to improve your quality of life, no matter where you're at. Last thing, if you want another video on that, I just made a video talking about a couple time management things that I think aren't very effective, like the Pomodoro technique. So you can click and watch that here, but if not, that's all I have for you today. So this has been the Happiness PhD with Jackson Kirchis. Thank you for watching.